Good afternoon, everyone. It's great to see so many of you sticking with us for the second day of the Legal Cheek Winter Virtual Vacation Scheme in partnership with the University of Law. I'm Aisha Hussain, Legal Cheek's Features Editor and your Chair for Session 4, Video Games and Digital Media, running until 3 p.m. Now, I'm sure the video game requires no introduction from old school classics like Pac-Man and Tetris to the relatively new Fortnite and Minecraft. Now, video games have kept generations entertained over the years, and the cost of developing a game can run into several millions, posing all sorts of challenges and risks. And that's where media lawyers come in. They advise on every stage of the process, from development and publishing to global distribution, licensing, financing, IP compliance, privacy and data protection. And they also have to keep up with the changing regulatory landscape in which um, digital businesses operate. Now, I have joining me two media lawyers from the law firm Wigan to tell you a bit more about this exciting growth area. So we have Peter Leon, a senior associate, and Isabel Davies, um, an associate, both specializing in video games at Wigan. And they're going to deliver a really fun joint presentation um, before we come together for a short Q&A that I will chair, um, which will be led by your questions from the chat. And I see that is filling up pretty quickly. And you can post your questions in the chat or the Q&A tab. Just make sure that your chat is set to stage. And that's where I will be monitoring the commentary as the talk goes on. So I'm now going to hand over to Peter and Isabel to begin their talk. And I'm going to drop off stage for this bit, but I will return for the Q&A. So over to you, Peter and Isabel. Thanks, Aisha. That was a very tall billing to, to say that this talk is going to be fun or entertaining or informative. I don't know. I can't guarantee any of those things. Um, we'll do our best. <laughs> so, so hi, my name is Pete um, and uh, I'm joined by my colleague Isabel. And we're, we're here to talk a little bit about our roles as, as video games lawyers. Um, because I, and I don't know if it's the same for you, Isabel, but every time I kind of meet someone new, an event or socially, and I say what I do, I say I'm a video games lawyer, the, the immediate reaction is kind of, oh, wow, that's cool. What, what, what do you do? What do you do? What type, of, what type of law do you practice or, or what type of work do you actually do on a day-to-day -day basis? So that's kind of the goal of this a little bit to tell you a bit about what we do, who we work with, what kind of work we do. Um, and also a little bit about how we got into the industry because Isabel and I both had pretty different career paths. So uh, can we go to the next slide, please? So here we are. Uh, again, my name is Pete. I'm a senior associate at Wigan. And I'm Isabel. I'm an associate at Wigan. And as you see on screen, a bit of Twitter and a bit of information about the games we're playing right now. Next yeah, I must, I must say that. that it's missing. Those are the games we're playing right now, Forza, Loop, Loop Hero, and Death's Door. But, uh, Long-time League of Legends player, uh, chagrin Isabel being a Dota Dota player, so I'm Dota two player all the way, <laughs> um, and World of Warcraft. I, I actually part of how I got my job where I am right now is because I used my example of raid leading in World of Warcraft uh, in my interview. Don't know if that's what sealed it, but anyway. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, we thought we'd start by talking a bit about how we each got to where we are today because like I say I think they're pretty different career paths so uh buckling because it's stuck with me for the next five minutes so I went to university to do my undergraduate at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland I started doing a joint degree in law and business um and then dropped pretty rapidly out of uh the business side of things and did a straight uh degree in law um I basically like I basically didn't didn't do any commercial focused subjects or company law focused subjects at university. I, I did a lot of uh, medical jurisprudence and international dispute settlement, criminal law. Uh, I don't, don't environmental law, don't quite know why. I, I guess I never really thought I was going to become a practicing solicitor. I didn't think I'd become any other type of lawyer, but I don't know, just enjoyed those subjects. So, so I kind of got to the end of my degree and I, I hadn't, hadn't focused on commercial work much. Uh, but I was lucky enough uh, in my, I think it was my second year, to get a training contract at a firm called McGregor's back then. Um, it's a S Scottish firm um, in Edinburgh. So I was pretty lucky that from from about second year onwards, I pretty much had the next four or five 
years of my life planned out to finish my degree, do my diploma, do my training contract and go on from there. Um, and then I, uh, McGregor's eventually merged uh, before I started my training contract with Pinsent Masons. Pinsent Masons, the very large kind of international law firm, uh, big presence down in London. And in my training contract, I did uh, a whole bunch of different seats in, uh, I think it was energy, property, uh, pensions, litigation, to common at a company called Mercer. And then I got to my, my final seat, which is an intellectual property, which I was really excited about because it's something which is closer to my kind of interests. But I realized that I didn't didn't actually know anything about intellectual property. I never studied it at university. Uh, I didn't didn't know the first thing: copyright, trademarks, patents, whatever. So I, I I wanted to teach myself about it before I went into that seat, so I don't look like an absolute plonker. Um, and I figured, well, if I'm going to learn about something, I might as well. I always found the best way was to kind of deploy that knowledge. Um, so I, I started writing, learning and writing blogs uh, on video games related matters. So YouTube. Uh, uh, fair use issues, disputes that are coming up around copyright and trademarks in the games industry. So I started writing a blog and then again, I created a Twitter profile and started tweeting out to people that I, I was Googling and finding were games lawyers. I, at the time, I didn't really know that was a thing. So I just started Googling games lawyers and finding their Twitter profiles and tweeting it to them. Um, and everyone was very kind. It was like, oh, that's very interesting. Probably never read it. Um, but there was one guy, uh, a guy called Jazz Purewall who uh, did take the time to read it. And uh, I sent him enough posts over a long enough period of time. And one day I saw that uh, he was tweeting about being particularly busy and he wished there were some more budding video games lawyers out there that would uh, would come join him. So I think he was saying that a bit flippantly, but I took it very literally. And I sent him my CV, uh, sent him some of my blog posts and I was like, you should, you should hire me. So over about I think he got back to me and was like, I'm very busy, very great, no, lovely to meet you, um, I'll have a think about it. Pestered him for like six months and then, uh, long story short, kind of bullied him into giving me a job. So I, I uh, finished my training contract at Pinsent Masons up in Scotland and then came down to join this guy called Jazz, who I found on the internet, uh, who was doing video games law at his own firm that he set up called Pure and Partners to go down and become a video games lawyer. So. Uh, I'm, I'm quite a risk averse person, but uh, looking back on it, it was, it was undoubtedly the best thing that has ever happened to me uh, career wise, because uh, Jazz uh, and Pure One Partners was kind of a fantastic, uh, I mean, I was going to say stepping stone into the industry, but it, it was not just a stepping stone. It was a fantastic place to kind of learn and grow as a lawyer. So uh, I was there for about five, five to six years. And then last November, uh, Pure and Partners was acquired by Wigan, uh, so that was November, and ever since Isabel and I have been part of the Wigan Games team, um, and we've essentially combined the entirety of Pure and Partners with the existing team at Wigan, and now we've got an even larger games team. Uh, and that's it from me. Yeah, so on, on the flip side of kind of Pete's journey into games law, mine is a, a little bit different. So I did, I did law at the University of Nottingham, and similar to Pete, I kind of was, you know, taking various modules um, over the course of my degree with no kind of real clear direction. Um, and in my second year, I basically got heavily into student radio and student journalism. So I was doing like a, a film and games related radio program um, at university. And I was also like writing a lot of um, film reviews and game reviews for my student, uh, student magazine. Um, and to be honest, during my second year, I was kind of committed to becoming a radio presenter. And it wasn't until my third year I kind of had this brainwave of maybe I could combine this kind of media experience that I've picked up over the course of uni, my law degree and my love of games. Um, so as I said, it wasn't until my third year of uni that I was kind of even thinking about going, actually committing to law and trying to essentially carve my kind of games law career path, which, uh, you know, as Pete highlighted, there weren't a huge amount of people exclusively doing games law back in, uh, this is 2013, so you know, seven or eight years ago. So it's a pretty pretty niche field to kind of want to get into. But ultimately, I was like, I love games. I know a lot about games. It's a growing industry. I think it's I think it's going to be like a good thing to try and carve a career path um, in. Um, so at the end of I finished uni and I basically applied and got an internship at Disney Interactive in their commercial and business development team. Um, I went through the exact crisis that I know a lot of students go through, which is you finish uni and you have zero in practice legal experience. And you want to get it, but no one's going to give you a job unless they, you know, you have the LPC already or you've already worked for a pilot for five years. 
which is obviously very irritating when you're 21 fresh out of uni so the next best thing for me was getting kind of I thought if I got kind of BD commercial experience at a games company that kind of feeds in quite well to the legal side um and ultimately once I started that job at Disney I kind of turned around and said to my boss a few months in um you know can I do some legal work on the side you know if I've got time and he was very very open to that so I actually managed to get a fair amount of decent legal games experience under my belt in that year as well um because my boss was essentially you know wanted to kind of help me kind of become you know a game lawyer one day so that was you know huge part of my kind of career was having that great first boss that basically wanted to see me grow and then my second role uh once that year ended uh, at Disney Interactive I then got a paralegal job at King um again it's one of those situations where you kind of if you don't ask you don't get which I think Pete has you know touched upon a bit um I applied for a corporate paralegal role at King having no corporate law experience at all like I'd never seen a board minute never seen any of that um and ultimately I wasn't really that interested in corporate law I was more interested in the kind of commercial game side um and then a King recruiter emailed me back and said you know you don't really have the corporate law experience that we're looking for but we were just about to basically put out this commercial product paralegal role in a couple of months um as I said, we weren't planning to hire for a few months, but we think you look great for the role. Why didn't you come in and interview for it? And then again, the rest was history. I just met the team. They really liked the experience I had at Disney. They liked my passion for games. And I managed to essentially secure this role that I didn't even know existed yet, which turned out to be completely perfect and exactly the kind of games work they wanted to be doing. Um, so I did a lot of work on, you know, Candy Crush when it was kind of in its like, you know, big kind of original peak era, you know, 2015, 2014, um, and like a huge amount um, from the kind of growth of mobile games businesses and free to play games that was a great experience um and at this point you know I was still thinking you know I need to go off and qualify at some point I think I've got some you know games experience under my belt now so hopefully that will help me kind of get into the kind of firms that I would like to qualify at which you know the more kind of media and entertainment skewed firms and I then got into a conversation with a couple of lawyers that I worked with and said oh I I follow this Jazz Purell guy on Twitter. Like, I really would like to meet him at some point because he seems like he's doing so much games work. It seems really interesting. Transpired a couple of the lawyers that I worked with had worked with him back at a media firm called All Swang several years before. Um, so they said, we'll, we'll drop him a line and you can go have a coffee with him. So I went and had a coffee with Jazz. And then, you know, several conversations later, it transpired that essentially he also thought I would be a great fit for the firm. This is probably about six months after Pete joined. Um, so Pete was already in the PNP, in the PNP uh, trenches. Um, and then, yeah, I ended up doing my training contract at Purell and Partners, which again was quite a calculated risk because ultimately I was only in a firm where I was one of three lawyers, Pete included, Jazz included. Um, you know, it's not a typical kind of big law firm training contract experience. I did my LPC part time. I did it every other Saturday whilst I was doing my training contract full time, which was, you know, a tough 18 months, but absolutely the right thing for me to do because I really wanted to, you know, keep my finger on the pulse whilst I was working. Um, and I didn't I didn't too much fancy dropping out of work for a year um, and just going back to do the LPC full time. So it was perfect in that regard. And then, yeah, as Pete said, uh, as up, up until, you know, last November, we were you know, doing our own thing at PMP. And now we're part of a much bigger outfit at Wigan, which has been which has been a great fit for everyone. So that's how I got into games law. <laughs> so clearly very uh, conventional, and traditional and really easy to follow. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. <how's that? laughs> I think I think it's pretty fair to say, like you're saying as well, that it's it's quite a, a hard industry to break into. I I remember when I was speaking with recruiters uh, on qualifying or just before qualifying, saying a that I want to come down to England from Scotland, and a lot of them poo pooed that and they were like, well, English firms aren't going to want to take Scottish qualified solicitors, and then b getting into the entertainment space was incredibly competitive. Um, I think it was I was going to say it's, it was more so five or six years ago and we were both doing it um and there are more positions now but i still i still think it's really competitive to get into um so any opportunity you can kind of get to do work experience or any positions where you can take in-house roles or anything they're kind of if this is what you're interested in they're, they're kind of like gold dust yeah and i think just being able to set yourself apart a bit does help so i think like your blog p was something that really put you on p on p sorry, on, on your own radar on jazz's <laughs> radar whereas for me when I got my first job at Disney, my my then boss could not give couldn't give a monkey's if I'd done a law degree. He basically said to me like, "Oh, I went on your student radio website and listened to one of your podcasts about you know games," and I was like, absolutely mortified at the time that somebody had gone and looked at that. But that was something that got, got me that basically that first interview, and then had a conversation from there. So I think 
those extracurriculars that you do, those kind of contacts that you make really do kind of span a long time. Yeah. All right. Should we get into the uh, what we actually do? Yeah. And probably a bit more about Wigan as well. And Wigan, yeah. <laughs> Can you go to the next slide, please? Thank you. Yeah, so just at a high level, because I appreciate we've barely touched upon Wigan, um, but it's been an absolutely great home for um, us Pure and Partners lot. Um, as I said, they've got an incredible existing games team. Um, now we're band one ranked for video games and just media and entertainment altogether. Um, they've also got, you know, probably the best film and TV team in the country at Wigan. Um, same for gambling. They do incredible gambling work. Um, so it's, it's a real like meeting of minds in terms of all these different sectors um under the Wigan roof um and there's some other interesting facts there like we're the largest dedicated games practice in Europe um we're the only law firm to represent all six major Hollywood film studios so it is incredibly incredible quality work at Wigan um across the board even if just games isn't your isn't your you know the thing that you love the most there's all this other fun media and tech and uh, uh gambling work going on as well next slide <laughs> sorry so yeah, I mean, th this is this is where this presentation normally starts. But so going, so going back a bit, where where what what do we actually do? Uh, when I say I'm a games lawyer, this this is pretty much the first reaction that people people give me. They go, "Oh, you just play games all day." Um, and I I wish people paid me to play games all day. Uh, <laughs> that'd be fantastic. Uh, and it does come up occasionally in the job. Uh, one of the things we'll touch on a little bit later is kind of content clearance things. Um, but no, unfortunately, uh, it's not just playing games. A large part of it, honestly, is uh, being a bit of a firefighter, a big part of the job is is kind of helping clients resolve things when they get a bit messy, whether it's a commercial dispute or, or trademark matter or a data protection matter. So usually dealing with things uh, when the house is on fire a little bit. But there's also a kind of side of it where you're trying to, to stop that from happening. So you get involved in things before they become uh, problems. Um, but yeah, it's not, not all just playing games. And, and I guess one of the things I probably should have clarified at the start is, is Isabel and I, we're, we're just video games lawyers. Like we, I think we're, we're, it's quite a unique opportunity that we have is that a hundred percent of what we do, both the Pure One Partners and a Wigan is we work exclusively in the video game space. We're not general media lawyers. We're not kind of tech lawyers that do a bit of games work. We are hundred percent day in, day out uh, video games, which I think is one of the things that gives us the, what what is the term used that was always uh when you're banded around when you're doing training contract applications commercial awareness we've got incredible commercial awareness about the industry because we live it and breathe it and we we both really love the industry as well next slide please so who do we work with uh so again it's all in the video games industry at least within our team we can obviously works with much wider clients but in the games team we work with anyone from game developers to game publishers and those are the people that kind of distribute the games and do the marketing for games that other people are making uh, we work with the likes of uh distribution platforms so you might know like steam or, or epic or gog and clients within those kind of buckets can range from really really small micro indies to which is basically a couple of couple of people making a game all the way up to really large it's called triple a I don't actually know what AAA stands for. It's just amazing, amazing, amazing. <laughs> no, I'm sure there's something. I'm sure there's something else. Uh, but AAA is kind of like the highest tier of quality games, the big blockbusters, the hundreds of million dollar games. Uh, so we work with clients across the whole spectrum. Um, you can see some of those on the screen here, and that really keeps it quite exciting because it basically means you're working with startups to some of the largest companies in the world, and the type of work that we get involved with really ranges drastically, client to client. Uh, next slide, please. So just to kind of give a bit of context, I know me and Pete have touched upon this already, how it's a growth industry, but I think it's always useful to see like a couple of stats in terms of where the industry is going. Um, and obviously this year in particular has been quite a unique year for games because even though, you know, year on year it has been growing massively, the pandemic was a, a quite a unique year in the sense that games is probably one of those few industries that actually did benefit quite a lot from the pandemic as more people stayed home, bought consoles, you know, people were using it to stay in contact with friends and family um, when people were, you know, unable to travel and, and see friends and family. Um, so this graph shows, I mean, it doesn't say 2021, but that will probably be like a pretty, pretty big jump. But 2023, the, you know, total market, global games market is anticipated to get to 217 billion, which is obviously just 
phenomenal amount. And by a lot of metrics, the games industry is by far the biggest media and entertainment industry um, in terms of revenue coming in. And it will probably continue to do so over the over the coming years. Next slide, please. And then this kind of just shows it a little bit more of a granular um, basis by country. So I think the interesting stats here, in particular, the kind of the year on years below the, the revenues. So all markets across the globe are growing in terms of games revenue. The biggest growth market is actually the Middle East and Africa. I think in Southeast Asia in particular, we've seen a huge amount of activity in the last couple of years, particularly as essentially better mobile phones that can handle better games are getting rolled out a lot into these markets. Um, but I think, again, on the right, 49% of all consumer spending on gaming in 2020 will come from the USA and China. China, absolutely huge market, um, which has its own special considerations, regulatory landscape. And again, that's something we'll probably touch upon later. But um, markets such as China are, a, you know, a unique, uh, has a unique set of issues and considerations for games. So that's exactly the sort of thing that we can help developers with and to be involved with. Um, but yeah, it's it's a very exciting industry to be in and it's a big growth industry. Next slide, please. Thank you. So that's who we are. That's that's who Wigan is. Uh, and that's the size of the industry at a glance. Now we're kind of getting on to the bit where we talk about what we what we do on a daily basis. And you can see on the slide here that we've tried to kind of structure it into it's kind of based around the life cycle of a product almost. So not necessarily the life cycle of a studio, because that can really be different, but the life cycle of a product is probably the clearest way to explain it. And that starts from, well, I guess we kind of do touch on the company aspects a little bit with the company formation. But then once the company's up and running, the really early stages of development, uh, how you actually get the money to kind of fund your game or develop it, uh, some of the pains you go through in, in, the pro in the course of developing. And then once your game is out, and once your game is maybe sunset because it gets old, which means kind of retiring it, and then there's a bunch of other miscellaneous considerations. So that's the that's the overall structure, the life cycle of of a game. Next slide, please. So yeah, so we're going to dive into each one of these a little bit more deeply, um, just to kind of give you an overview. And as Pete said, this is a good way of kind of explaining kind of at a high level what we do day to day and how and how varied it can be. So company formation is one of those things which is. Out of all the categories we're talking about over the next several slides, this is probably the one that's the most kind of kind of generic because ultimately a games business will, you know, start as a startup most times. Um, and that will be company formation. They'll need things like NDAs, contract agreements. They'll be the kind of initial kind of hiring and getting employees on board. There may be slightly more novel situations where you're doing things like via maybe a JV or having a subsidiary of a company that's being spun out onto something else. Um, but even even company formation isn't shy to have game specific issues. You know, we've come across situations where companies have been spawned out of a university project, which has its own IP considerations. Does the uni own the product? Do the students own the product? Um, and game jams as well is another very interesting topic here. You know, you, you get basically developers coming together and making a game over two or three days. But unless they've set out in advance who's going to own that game and what's going to happen with that game going forward, that can cause a lot of issues um and then as i said more generally there's of course like tax and corporate considerations about how things are set up um that you have to think about for games businesses so there's a huge amount even just straight off the bat even sometimes before the game development has even started that you have to kind of get in place and try and get right um to best protect the business essentially um and hopefully what will be a successful game next slide please cool so you got your company and you're actually starting uh development so our our kind of involvement here will like i say really depend on the type of client that we're acting for if you're working for one of the large internationals you're obviously not going to be doing a lot of kind of really early development works they're gonna they're gonna have all this down pat already so particularly when we're working with indie small studios we'll be doing a lot of the really early development kind of assistance um and so so that could range from anything like uh you'll see the picture here there's a there's an engine of a car and that's referring to the game engines that uh these games are built on so a lot of games companies don't don't build the kind of operating system of the game on which it's built the kind of uh it's kind of hard to describe what a game game engine is it's kind of like a like the framework like you develop the, framework. the game in yeah Think of it like Microsoft Word, like you don't build your own Microsoft Word, but you build the contents of the document that you're writing on. The game engine is kind of similar wrapper of tools and tech that you use to make a game. So uh, there'll be various different license agreements that you've got to review and negotiate all the different kind of financial arrangements uh, 
for the for the different game engines. There's kind of three, four, five, six uh, main ones out there. Um, and then you'll have to look at in the bottom left. There's a picture of the Unreal uh, Engine marketplace. So sometimes there are marketplaces out there where people just make assets specifically. They're not making games, but they make assets for other people to put into their games. So that could be anything from an art asset or a music file or a font or anything like that. And then sometimes they sell them through marketplaces that are usually run by the engine makers, the game engine makers, or sometimes they just distribute them via their own websites on the internet or Patreon or whatever. So sometimes you've got to get into the nitty gritty of looking at the license terms to make sure you've actually got the right uh, copyright licenses, whatever, to put that in your game. Uh, then there's also licensing in content. So that'll be one of the first things you do if you're making a licensed game. So if you're making a Star Wars game, for example, Disney's uh, quite prolific with um, its, its licensing. It's going into its kind of new stage now of, of licensing out its intellectual property. So that'll be one of the first things you absolutely got to do is make sure you've got the license to do it. And that'll be quite an, that'll, that'll be a really long involved process with any uh, major IP owner to, to think about things, what part of the IP you can use, uh, which parts you can't, how much creative control they want to have over it, how they, what say they have over what direction your game takes, tons of different things. That'd be a really important agreement. And then the last two pictures are some uh, just examples of what we call in the industry like content clearance. So that would be things like if you, the, the picture on the top right is from a game called Watch Dogs Legion. And that was a game that was made by Ubisoft, one of the big uh, French studios. And it was set in London and they had like a almost like street perfect recreation of London from all the like monuments and the famous sites down to kind of graffiti on the streets and not the actual graffiti, but the phone boxes and the right places. It was kind of wild. So we didn't do the work there, but they, they would have had to go through a content clearing ex exercise to see what can we actually put in the game and what can't, because you'd be surprised about the rules that are kind of attached to, uh, famous monuments in different countries and it's really quite different and then the last example here uh, it's just uh, an indie game was made using renaissance paintings and the kind of again we didn't do the work there but a question they would have had to think about is are, are all these are all these pieces of art in the public domain uh what, how do those rules work in different parts of the world how long is the copyright uh before it expires so content clarity stuff next slide please so the next the next fun side is uh, funding. Um, so there's kind of five broad categories that we've kind of summarised there. Um, but essentially, the ways that you can go about funding a game or a project can vary massively, and it's the, that kind of pool is only kind of getting bigger um, as you know as the industry grows. Um, so publishers are a great example of an agreement that we see very often. We tend to do work on the developer side, so we represent the developers in their negotiations with publishers and. Broadly, a publishing agreement is very is kind of like a project finance agreement. The publisher is basically agreeing to fund the development of a particular game. And that may be all of the publishing, all of the development funding. That may be just part of it. Um, and the kind of size and what publishers do can vary massively. Some of them are known for being, you know, absolutely pro marketeers. They know exactly how to market your game. Um, thus, there are some publishers that are very well known for just publishing specific types of games. So if, for example, you're, you're you know, developing a really niche PC strategy game, there may be certain publishers that you would love your game to be ideally published by. Um, so that's the sort of intel from like a commercial awareness perspective that we can, we've picked up a lot over the years because, you know, developers now come to us and say, we're talking to these three or four different publishers. What do you think of them? Um, but then, of course, we're there to actually advise them on the actual legal agreement of that as well. And that can be a pretty lengthy process depending on, how involved the publisher wants to be in the development process, what other services they're providing, not just marketing, but it might be QA, it might be localization of the title, um, it might be helping uh, ports of the game, which essentially are, you know, you develop the game, say, for PC, how do you get that on Xbox and PlayStation and all the other platforms? So that can vary massively. And publishers we see, you know, as, as I said, of all sizes and all shapes. And, you know, there's a lot more indie publishers nowadays than there used to be several years ago, which are kind of smaller publishers that maybe have a bit more of a niche. Um, but we see, you know, games doing hugely successful, hugely well out of even the smaller publishers now. Um, the grants and funds is also a very interesting one. Um, there's government grants available to games companies. So in the UK, the UK Games Grant is a very well-known grant um, that a lot of small indie developers can apply for. 
Um, and then again, there's been a growth in kind of funds from some of the larger games companies. So for example, Epic Games has a kind of development fund um, that it gives out to developers. Again, the kind of key stuff here is, you know, what, what are the restrictions or what are the kind of strings attached to that commercial engagement for those grants and funds? So then again, that's one that we would become involved with in terms of looking at those terms. Um, crowdfunding is a very interesting one. And it's crowdfunding is one of those areas that has slightly fallen off the radar a bit. It's definitely fallen out of favour, I think, a little bit. Um, it's still very popular for board games, but for video games, I think it has become less common. Um, I think probably the best example of crowdfunding of video games is the Star Citizen game, which I think up and up to, I think it has about three hundred fifty million dollars in funding now via crowdfunding, and the game's not even out yet. So we're we're hugely looking forward to seeing what they've done with that three hundred fifty million dollars at this point because it's it's been a long time coming. Um, angel and VC investment. Um, this is also kind of like a big growth area for games um, because games companies have been so popular. Um, in terms of acquisition targets and investment targets. So these can be anything from, um, you know, uh, specialist VC equity houses to actual games companies. Uh, Tencent and Embracer are two very well-known large games companies that have acquired a huge amount of game studios in the last several years. And then finally, tax credits. So tax credits, um, you know, is it's unique to like kind of the country you're developing in. Um, here in the UK, we have the Video Games Tax Relief, which is a really, really useful uh, tax relief that game studios can apply for to essentially reclaim back some of the tax that they paid um, on their development costs um, in the UK. But they do have to pass certain cultural tests uh, for their game and their staff, which is interesting. But again, that's something we can advise on in terms of sitting down with their accountants and working out if the game passed these certain tests or not. So again, huge amount of different ways of funding, all of which we have and do advise on. Um, so there's a lot to take into account there. Next slide. Thank you. So you've got your company, you've done some of the early groundwork, you've got your license for your IP if you need it, you've got your money to actually make the game. And now you're now you're now you're actually making the thing. You you've got all the pieces in place, got all the money, you can start development or continue development. So that's when you might be doing things like scaling your studio. So that'll involve a lot of uh, hiring, maybe firing. So you'll be dealing with uh, employees and contractors. Um, and sometimes you'll be dealing with that on an international basis, particularly with the move to kind of remote working. A lot of game studios are doing that now. So there's obviously a lot of legal implications and, and cons complications around that. You, uh, you might have ongoing, uh, we might be advising with ongoing issues with their partners that they've, that they've chosen to make the game with. So for example, their publishing partner, sometimes they'll have agreed a kind of time schedule uh, within which to develop the game. And maybe the game is like a little bit late or it's gonna go over budget or they wanna change the, the scope of the game design a little bit. So there's a lot of uh, discussions that have to happen there on a kind of business to business level and then reflected in the paperwork. We might also do additional content clearance sweeps at this stage. Uh, so we've had things related to uh, in-game graffiti, uh, people saying that in the graffiti in the game is ripping off their graffiti that they've done in real life. We've had uh, art teams accidentally use famous people in games without their permission. We've had issues to do with font licenses, and that is a super glam area. Uh, <laughs> no, it's not really, but surprisingly uh, complicated because uh, fonts are something you don't really think about. But there are businesses that make businesses that are entirely that's their whole business. That's their whole business is font licensing. And it's really easy for our teams to just kind of grab one they see online and, and rip it off or use it without getting a license. Uh, weapons is obviously another really big thing. Uh, so making sure that your in-game weapons either aren't recreating exactly real world weapons or ripping off weapons from other games. Uh, I had a client one time ask me if they can use Garfield in a really inappropriate way uh, and then claim it under parody, uh, parody exceptions, whether or not that would be fine. The answer was no, unless you are really sold on this and that creative vision uh, and you're happy with taking that risk there. Uh, and then there's things like tattoos even being used in video games. So there's a couple of interesting lawsuits in the US right now um, in relation to whether or not wrestlers tattoos in video games should the video game developer have gotten a license from the tattoo artist or the person the tattoo studio to to put that tattoo in the game so it sounds like a really dumb question uh the two cases at the moment one's gone one way another one's kind of going another way for various different reasons but it's a really interesting thing that could have pretty large knock-on implications 
So content clearance. Uh, then there's kind of risk assessment stuff that we could do uh, for AR games. So augmented reality, that'd be the likes of Pokemon Go. So there you've got to think about not just kind of digital risks, but you've got to think about physical risks to safety, uh, predatory behavior, vandalism, and what kind, of, what kind of steps can a game developer actually take to, to mitigate those and warn users of those risks. Got music licensing issues. Uh, so if you've seen the like, uh, you've probably seen some of these artists having uh, concerts in games like Fortnite or Roblox or, or Minecraft, whatever. So there's obviously a ton of music licensing on, a, on an international basis that has to happen there. Um, and then again, I mean, there's just an infinite list that I could keep going through, like open source issues, user generated content issues, gambling mechanic reviews. So that's uh, loot boxes is one of the things that's received a lot of attention lately. That's the idea of buying a, a randomized chest of things in a game. Um, and that's getting a lot of attention from gambling authorities around the world. So we, we had to skill up on, on gambling law there, basically. And I think back at Brill and Partners, we were kind of one of the first firms to actually look at this issue of applying gambling law to this issue of loot boxes and games. And it's still going on five years later, and it's kind of a really winding path. So really quite varied in terms of what we do. Next slide, please. So yeah, so obviously Pete's touched upon a bunch of stuff that come up in development and then the list kind of just continues to grow as you kind of get closer to launch. Um, so this is a smattering of stuff that we've put down here of things that quite often we talk to developers about in the kind of three to six months before launch. Um, when the game development, you know, is possibly coming to an end or is at least the game is kind of in semi-final form. Um, so as you said, trademarks for the game name seems obvious, but that needs to be taken into account consumer docs, thinking about, you know, terms of service, privacy policies, what that looks like. Um, launch campaigns, working with influencers, doing marketing clearance to trailers, um, distribution agreements as well as an interesting one, um, because, you know, the publisher that you've signed up with originally, you may they may only have some rights to do some platforms, but you might also want to do kind of physical box sets that sit in game and John Lewis, etc., cetera, um, and not just sell it digitally. Um, age ratings, um, continue to be fun and games as well that that varies depending on the market and can vary in terms of what forms you're having to fill in and what kind of you know what content is problematic in one country may not be problematic in another country so that can make things a bit tricky uh content clearance as pete said it's an ongoing an ongoing piece content clearance but again you obviously want to do probably another sweep once the game's a little bit more in its final form um Otherwise, you know, things things can you can clear things and then you later get removed from the game. So then you have to kind of do that exercise again. Um, and that can be anything from intellectual property. So as Pete said, you know, copyright infringement issues. But then that can also be consumer and regulatory issues, particularly in free to play games where the monetization is kind of built into the game. Um, data protection is becoming more and more important. Um, obviously, with the advent of GDPR a few years ago, that's something that games companies are having to be way more alive to than they were even five or six years ago. Um, and player protection, particularly games for kids, as we put here, this is becoming more of a live issue um, for those that are interested in kind of tech and online regulation uh, more generally. You'll know that there's a general push towards kind of online safety and protecting kids. So that will probably continue in that kind of direction for years to come. And then spoilers and leaks is an interesting one, um, you know, dealing with, you know, game copies that have fallen off backs of vans a few days before they're supposed to be out and people are streaming them on Twitch in advance is always an interesting topic to deal with. And it's a bit more fast paced than some of the other stuff we do, but um, thankfully it doesn't come up too often. Next slide. Thank you. Conscious of timing here, so I'm gonna I'm gonna canter through these. So you've got time for Q and A. So once your game comes out, it's gonna be in the public's hands, and that that leads to a bunch of other issues that you have to deal with you didn't have before. So live operations is is kind of the the long tail of the game, the continuing to support the game after it's come out. That might be new content, fixing bugs. Um, which obviously involves a bunch of work on the developer side and maybe other partners. There will be customer issues. So customers can complain about uh, misleading or, or false advertising. We've had issues to do with uh, gaming addiction. That's particularly a big issue in China at the moment uh, or parental controls that kind of touches on Isabel's point about child protection and also privacy. We've even dealt with issues about uh, what's the responsibility of game developers when it comes to people talking about suicide in their games. Do they have an obligation to kind of report this to authorities or police or do anything about it? So uh, then there's ports. That's like Isabel said, you can be taking your game to another to another platform, getting other partners to help with that. There's new territories. So your game might come out in some parts of the world, but you can't get it out in other parts until later. China's a great example, ginormous market, very, very complicated. It was basically the largest market 
Um, but now it's becoming one of the most closed off and actually restrictive to actually get a game released there because to get a game out on mobile or basically any other console or almost yeah basically any other platform now you have to get approval from the the state uh, state regulatory authorities and that can take upwards of years and there's priority given to Chinese uh chinese games even chinese games have to get approved and western games are just uh, kind of on the back burner so huge opportunity but incredibly difficult to get your game out there uh monetization so uh things like the advertising authority will tell you how you've got to uh, sell your game including to children and adults different things for different ages uh, and then there's streaming merchandise and esports but i don't have time to get into any of those uh, but those are all kind of things that uh, are kind of other activities that you could do when you've got your game out Next slide, please. So yeah, this is a quick one. So hopefully you don't have to sunset your game. Um, hopefully your game just continues to be, you know, hugely successful forever. But obviously games and businesses, they do have to sometimes think, okay, it's not worth us keeping this game alive anymore. Maybe you're paying for server costs. Maybe you're paying for kind of customer support costs on a particular game. Um, so we deal with, you know, the winding down of a game. Most, mostly it's consumer issues and data issues. So what do you do with the data that you've collected up until now? And you know, how do you essentially handle customer complaints, refunds, etc.? What does that look like? Because you ultimately want to do it in as fair a way as possible, um, in a way that's obviously legally compliant. So we obviously help with the wind down of the game as well. Next slide. So I think this is our final slide. This is like our catch-all bucket. So again, we'll kind of just whip through these. So um, infringement in DMCA comes back to kind of intellectual property. Um, we obviously deal with things like clone games. So sometimes, in particularly on mobile, uh, we'll have a game developer release a game and then somebody in another country basically co completely copies that and releases it. So we deal with the kind of DMCA takedown um, take uh, matters. Increased regulation, have touched upon this already, and this is becoming an increasingly large part of at least my role, um, which is dealing with the fact that there's just more laws coming in for tech and games that impact how uh, games companies can develop and sell their games. Um, so that's continuing to be an interesting area. And then gamification. Um, is an interesting one again because ultimately uh you know you get health apps nowadays that have got elements of games or interactivity in them um you've got companies like netflix doing kind of interactive um stories on their platform and getting into games so even though you know most of our work is very much in the core games industry there are other sectors out there doing um gamesy things that they need their advice on as well yeah and then we've got the likes of Crypto and NFTs couldn't do a talk without mentioning NFTs. I'm surprised Metaverse isn't in here as well. We really missed a trick. Oh, out. no. Okay, yeah. crypto, <sighs> NFTs, uh, and Metaverse All as well. The, throw the buzzwords in there. It's just buzzwords, yeah. A um, lot of that. So, uh, yeah, blockchain, uh, I think, is, is getting a lot of attention lately, is getting a lot of investment. Games is going to be one of the areas where I think it's going to be most rapidly deployed. So, understanding blockchain and the various applications of it, like NFTs super relevant to what we do. It's a very complicated space, uh, very evolving space, and people are moving very quickly in it. So it's it's quite a tricky one. Uh, unions. So there's been there's been a bit of a Me Too movement, I think, over the last couple of years in the games industry um, at a number of large uh, games developers and publishers. And I think that's pouring quite a lot of fuel on the fire towards employees unionizing in the industry historically hasn't really done too much in this space yet um some countries have but not not kind of the uk europe and and america but we're starting to see the embers of that is embers embers the start of it or is the embers the end we're starting to see the beginnings of it i think um and then m a so uh no surprise tons of money in games everyone wants to get in games uh, so there's just a huge amount of both M&A and also investment going on in the space. I think Isabel and I are probably working with our corporate team on five, six plus games deals at the moment. Um, like I say, across acquisition to selling to investments. So very active. And our role there is really supporting the the corporate team. Not do, not. I mean, it could really range, but not doing things like the full share purchase agreement or the asset purchase agreement but helping with kind of game specific elements of that, sometimes the due diligence and also looking at specific sections of those corporate documents. Next slide. And I, I think that kind of wraps it up. Yeah. Any questions? Um, I think we're going to get on to questions, but Isabel, like if we had to, I, I, get, I don't want to touch on the toes of the question too much, but I think it's pretty fair to say that it's a, it's a really varied role, which, which probably depends, probably changes quite a lot depending on what firm you're at, but because we work, 
in games 100% of the time, and we touch on a lot of different areas. We do a lot of commercial work, a lot of regulatory, um, but also a kind of smorgasbord of everything, right? It kind of comes back to PMP when it was just the three of us and we did everything. <laughs> Jack of all trades, yeah. Jack of all trades, yeah. <laughs> Master so of on all. That note, <laughs> um, thank you very much, Peter and Isabel, for that very interesting talk. Um, students are loving the memes that, um, and um, so we're, we're just going to move on to the um, Q and A um, section now. Starting with this question: so, specialising in video games and media law, as you both do, is one of a few areas of law where you can actually combine a lifelong hobby with work. Um, like the same can't be said um, about tax law, can it? Right. Um, <laughs> but how do you go about gaining experience in what Peter you described is a very competitive industry? Um, a few students have, have been asking this in the chat. Yeah, so a lot of, I, I, I like to, I speak with quite a, quite a large number of students and, and people in their training contracts because I, I like to give back because I know how bloody difficult it was. And I get, what, what I see quite a lot of the time is people go, it's a really exciting industry to work in, but it's, it's almost somewhat of, of like a surface level interest in games because it seems kind of exciting and sexy and, and a little bit different. And I think it is a lot more exciting than a lot of areas of, of practicing law. But when you dig a little deeper and you go, okay, is this actually what you're kind of really passionate about? In is do you, do you like games outside of work? Do you, do you find them interesting on a personal level? Um, they're not always, uh, it's not always deeper than skin deep. But if you if you are kind of really interested in the industry, then you'll you'll kind of do whatever you can to, to scrape any little bit of uh, connections you can make here and there. I mean, Twitter is great. I think all the games lawyers we know are on Twitter or, or, or a bunch of them are. So engage with them there, uh, attend a lot of events. So in London, for example, outside of COVID, there's uh, an organization called Yuki. Uh, it's the games industry trade body. They used to put on a bunch of events that uh, you can kind of go along to. There's games conventions all throughout the country uh, that you can go to. And basically anything you can do to to show that you've got an interest outside of saying you basically show, don't tell um, is the best way. And there's tons of ways in games that you can do that. Great. Thanks for that, Peter. Um, and there is, of course, the, the Wigan training contract that launched a few years ago. Um, could you maybe tell us a bit more about the training contract at Wigan and maybe some of the work that trainees can get involved in? So obviously neither of us actually trained at Wigan. Um, so we're very much seeing it from our kind of own trainees perspective. Um, but it's it's a really varied training contract because ultimately we've got all these different amazing departments, both from the actual sector experiences that we discussed, you know, film and TV, video games, digital more generally, gambling. But then also we've got really excellent teams in, you know, IP, corporate, litigation. Um, so you end up having a very, very, very training contract. And it's also not because we're not a massive firm, it's not a massive intake. So it has a real collegiate, um, friendly feel, the firm, which is, I think, one of the things that, for me, I was super pleased about when we were acquired, is that we kind of kept that kind of tight-knit um, feeling, even though the work was, you know, doing this incredible work for a firm that's actually, you know, relatively small compared to a lot of the, you know, big bear moths out there. Um, so I think it's one of those things that if you get a training contract at Wigan, you'll have a really interesting and varied experience. Great. So um, we've touched on training and work experience. Well, but what about skills that make a good media lawyer? Now, we've got a poll that's been running in the background um, that I'd now like to draw your attention to. Um, you'll find it in the second tab under stage in the right um, sidebar. And the question for this workshop is, what is the most important skill for lawyers working in the digital entertainment industry? And you've got a range of options to choose from, and they are legal excellence, proficiency in all digital entertainment, commercial awareness, or a passion for gaming. I can see some of you have already voted, um, but I'll give those of you that haven't yet had the chance to vote to do so now. Um, and we'll see what comes out on top. Okay, so it looks like the third option, commercial awareness has come out on top with the majority of the vote, 52.8% voting this way. Um, Peter, Isabel, what, what do you make of that result? Do you go first, Isabel? Yeah, OK. Um, I, yeah, commercial awareness, awareness is super important because I think as kind of Pete touched upon there, 
you have to be able to show rather than just tell. And just being into games and playing games isn't really enough to kind of just become a digital entertainment lawyer. Um, I think legal excellence is probably still the most important one because ultimately you have to be a good lawyer. Um, I think, again, that's the thing that sometimes I think people can lose sight of is, yes, we're video games lawyers, but we are still lawyers. So we have to be good at our jobs and we have to know exactly what we're doing from a legal perspective. Um, otherwise, otherwise, you're potentially in trouble. Um, but I think commercial awareness and legal excellence are definitely kind of the, the big two, ultimately. Do you agree, Pete? Or... Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that. I mean, legal excellence is just assumed. Like when, whenever you're speaking with clients, they don't, they don't, they, they just assume you know what you're talking about. Um, commercial awareness, I think, is the real value add that we add value add that we add uh in our in our roles because yeah we live and breathe the industry in our in our in our work life but also in our personal lives like Isabel and I love the industry like in our spare time we're kind of reading about the industry and um, people working in it going on Twitter reading games news so I think the commercial awareness is super important and I think it's the value add that not all lawyers in the space have quite as much of because they don't work in the industry dedicated like we do just touching on what you mentioned, um, Peter, like a passion for the industry. Um, I just wanted to ask, because a passion for gaming came out third um, in the poll. And a student, um, Dale Cornish, actually came in the chat um, earlier asking, is being a gamer prerequisite for this practice area? Because I find the law behind them interesting, so IP and international licensing. Um, and the games themselves are a fun product, but I'm not a gamer. So what would your advice be to Dale? Yeah, I, I think it I think it'll certainly help. I think it's really, really important to to like the industry that you have chosen to work in, whatever it is. I personally cannot imagine being a banking or a finance lawyer, but I know friend I have friends that love doing that. So I think having an interest in it really helps. Is it a prerequisite? Not at all. Um I know a bunch of fantastic games lawyers that have an interest in games kind of because they work in it but do they go away and, and play games in their spare time no i mean a lot of them have got families or, or it's just not super what they want to do but they they make it work because they are really great in their field and they know enough to to kind of to keep abreast of what's going on in, on in the industry but you don't have to go away and play games at night time so i think it helps but not a prerequisite Great, thanks, Peter. Um, let's move on to a question about COVID. Um, so how did the coronavirus pandemic and shutdown of industries such as retail and leisure um, impact the video gaming industry? Um, I'm presuming in a positive way, given that we were all cooped up indoors and we continue to be. Um, any thoughts there? Yeah, I think I think on the whole, I think the kind of kind of overall messaging for games was that it was it was actually, you know, one of the few industries that did actually do well out of it. But I think if you look a bit under the hood, it was definitely the kind of big the big players in the games industry that did particularly well out of it. I assume because they could probably leverage their own um frameworks and infrastructures already. And for example, I think, you know, some of the big publishers had their their kind of, you know, sales between like physical box copies of games versus digital copies. It was already kind of going towards more digital copies being sold, but that kind of accelerated it because people weren't able to just go out into the store and buy a game. Um, I think at the start of the pandemic, there was a kind of a month's period where some game studios were kind of just kind of getting themselves sorted to do, um, you know, full time remote working. But the nature of the games industry generally is that it's been very remote working first for a long time, or at least that has always been an option. Um, and even at, when we were back at Pure Partners, we were already doing, you know, a day a day a week from home, working from home. Um, and a lot of our clients were doing the same thing. Um, we did most of our meetings remote. We did very few in-person meetings. So, you know, when the kind of call did come that everything was shutting down, it was just a case of going, okay, we're, we're now doing this from one to two days a week to full time. Um, so I think the industry was actually very quick to adapt both from a consumer sales perspective, but also, a, you know, developing games and all the support functions like us legal, you know, around the edge of it. Um, so I think, you know, it was overall for most games companies, they were able to kind of weather it quite well for some of the large games companies in particular. They did incredibly well out of it from a financial perspective. Great. Thanks, Isabel. So I'm going to move on to this next question because I'm conscious of time. Um, so tech giants, Google, Meta and Apple, they've all made plans to enter the video game industry. So how do you an anticipate these tech giants sort of jostling with traditional gaming companies for a share of the market yeah so i think i think i mean apple's been in there 
forever like they've got they 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 run the the apple app store and gaming is a huge part of it i think i think games makes up the majority of of money generated on app stores as a whole i think apple and google so i'd say they're already in the space uh on that front i don't think either of them uh are making exclusive content i don't think apple is making apple they don't have like in-house developers to make games i don't think that's the plan google is a little bit different because they run google play and they ran this thing called stadia which is kind of a cloud game streaming thing which came a couple years ago and then proceeded to quite quickly uh flop um because i i don't think they'd quite worked out their their business proposition to make it real value for the customer so Again, Google's still in it in the sense they've got Google Play, but are they making their own games? Not really, although Google Stadia is continuing to exist. And what, what was the other company that you mentioned? Sorry. And uh, Meta. Meta. Yeah, I mean, Facebook's been there for donkeys as well, right? They had Facebook gaming. That's not a new thing. That was one of the kind of the Social largest. gaming mecca, yeah. Yeah, social gaming is absolutely huge. Um, do, and now they've got Oculus, the VR device, so they, they're probably the front runner in VR gaming at the moment because they own that. Uh, are they making their own games? I, I don't know, to be honest. I mean, Meta is quite new. It's it's not going to be surprising if they unveil new games as part of the uh, VR metaverse. So I think uh, that could be a thing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they've just um, recently released like VR space, Horizon Worlds um, in the US and Canada recently. Um, and just on virtual reality, um, I have a question here asking, what, what are some of the limitations preventing AR and VR from becoming mainstream? I think some of the limitations, well, first of all, it's partly tech based. So for VR in particular, there's the ongoing issue of, I think, pricing and the amount of infrastructure that you can need for VR to, to make it worthwhile. And a lot of people still struggle with things like motion sickness when it comes to VR. I mean, I also personally, after about 15 minutes of playing on a VR game, do tend to feel a little bit sick. And I'm someone that's got all the kit in the world for gaming. But ultimately, if it makes me feel ill, I'm probably not going to pick it up. Um, so I think, you know, there's a huge amount of work done, done in terms of the actual science and psychology of VR and the developments of that. And I think ultimately, I think VR will continue to be you know, a subset of gaming, but in terms of it becoming like this massive thing that explodes, I think it's probably going to take a lot longer and it might, it might never be the kind of de facto go to um, for games. Um, I think there is, you know, a fair amount of cynicism on that front from a consumer perspective um, and augmented reality. I think again, there's a huge amount of tech behind that. So Niantic, you are probably the kind of the AR games company who they make Pokemon go and the, the Harry Potter game, although that recently got sunset, um, they've actually started licensing out their AR tech um, to developers um, because I assume they think it will be a good way to kind of either accelerate development in this space and also get them some money and some data and some insight. Um, but ultimately, you know, as Pete was saying, AR in particular has a lot of unique risks, both in the digital and the physical space. So there's a lot of stuff that they have to get over in terms of making a viable, safe product. And then you've got to make it a success on top of that. Thanks, Isabel. I'm conscious of time. So um, let's talk NFTs quickly. So Mida Tanubu has come in the chat saying, I know a few people are talking about the potential for NFTs in video games. Do you foresee any changes to the game industry involving NFTs? And have you seen any interesting trends in your work as well? Oh, goodness. The short answer to this question, we've only got two minutes left, which is probably good. Um, short answer is, I think the technology is interesting. I think it's going to have, I, I think there's definitely going to be implementation in the game space. I think it's going to be the biggest implementation of NFTs. I think some of the deployments of the technology are absolute garbage. Um, and I, I think some are really interesting, uh, just like any technology. So I think there's good and bad deployments of it. I think there's right now probably an imbalance in favor of bad actors as opposed to really uh, like kind of established companies using the tech for, for good things. So, I mean, it's not hard to find uh, people like scams and what have you. But I do think it's something which is gaining a lot of traction. Like I say, it's gaining a lot of investment. There are really smart people that are focused on this and think it's a really big thing. But I think there's a lot of big issues they're going to have to overcome, including environmental issues, educating the users, and also the kind of games in the established games industry players. And there's a lot of stigma to overcome. So yeah, great, 
great potential if they can work out all of these kinks and find a good value proposition and kind of comply with regulations or laws, yeah. Thanks, Peter. Um, so let's close with a final question from Amani Siddiqui. Um, and that's, what's the most interesting work you've both handled in the last 12 months? Um, get an answer from both of you on this. Um, so for me, so I, I do an increasing amount of work in the regulation space. So there's been a bunch of different work responding to queries from a bunch of different regulators. Um, I, I'm, try, I'm being careful with what I can say here exactly, but I guess one thing that has been quite an interesting development, I think, for the games industry has been the introduction of the Children's Code, which is a code that comes off the back of GDPR, and it came in last September. Um, and it's it's kind of no secret that obviously the social media giants are, are kind of being looked at there, but also games, I think, is one of those industries that um, there has been a, a fair amount of focus on in that space. So there's been there's been work around that, which I, I found really interesting because it's it's ultimately very product driven. It's very game driven. So that's been good. And Peter? And and for me, a lot of my work is on the kind of commercial transactional side. So, uh, and, and if we're talking about the last 12 months, I probably can't talk about anything that I've been doing, but I get to, to get to help a lot of really smart, cool developers uh, do a lot of licensed games. And there's a whole bunch that haven't been announced, but I'm personally really excited to play them in due course. If I was to go back beyond 12 months, I think one of the, the kind of coolest projects I've done was working with Riot Games, the esports company, the maker of League of Legends, with their their franchising of the European League of Legends ecosystem. So that was a massive project, uh, tens of millions of pound like dollars buy in from a whole bunch of different teams all around the world to play esports competitively. And working with Riot to kind of structure that and figure out the terms of teams buying it was really cool. Amazing. Thanks very much, Peter. Um, I'm afraid that's all we have time for, but thank you very much, Peter and Isabel, for your time today. Um, we're now going to head into the networking. And just like in previous sessions, you'll get to video chat with each other for around three minutes or so at a time. Um, and the speakers will also be heading there too, and you might be paired with one of them. So um, Peter and Isabel, please could you now make your way to the um, networking now? Okay. Just click the blue return button at the bottom of your screen. Thanks everyone. Happy holidays.